Fair Review, print speaking to the blind, celebrating 40 years of audio newspaper production. Welcome to this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast, recorded at the Bishop Briggs Media Centre by our amazing volunteers. You can get in touch with us via Facebook, Twitter or Instagram using at Kuhn Review, that is at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W. You can also contact us directly by emailing information at cunereview.com. That is I-N-F-O-R-M-A-T-I-O-N at symbol C-U-E-A-N-D-R-E-V-I-E-W dot C-O-M. Or by calling 0141 772 3976. That's 0141 772 3976. From the Herald Scotland, Wednesday the 6th of March, from the Sports Section. RNA make changes to open exemption categories, but no concession to LIV. Article by Martin McMillan. The RNA has made changes to exemption categories for the open, but there has been no concession to LIV golf. With no world ranking points available to players on the Saudi Breakaway Tour, it is becoming increasingly difficult for them to qualify via that route, although as former major winners, John Ram, Cameron Smith, Dustin Johnson, Brutes Kepka, Bryson DeChambeau and Phil Mickelson already have places in the field for Royal Troon in July. Other LIV golfers guaranteed spots without having to qualify are Terrell Hatton, Dean Burmester, Adrian Mironk, Joaquin Nyman, Louis Oosthuizen and David Puig. As relations continue to thaw between the previously warring parties as a result of a merger agreement between the PGA Tour and LIV, there had been suggestions that the the RNA could make allowances for LIV golfers, particularly after its chief executive Greg Norman wrote to players on Tuesday to say it would no longer be pursuing its long battle to secure world ranking points. Masters champion Ram one of three LIV golfers with a win in the last five majors, was not a fan of the rankings before he made the move in December. I'm going to go back to what I said two years ago. I didn't think it was a good system back then, said the Spaniard ahead of LIV Golf Hong Kong, which begins on Friday. If anything, the more time goes on, the more it proves to, to be wrong. The most significant change made by the RNA is the reduction of the exemption period for new champions, to the age of 55. Past champions will still be able to play until the age of 60. Tom Watson famously came close to winning a six claret jug just seven weeks before his 60th birthday at Turnberry in 2009. Other changes will see players competing on the Asian Tour, the Japan Golf Tour, the PGA Tour of Australasia and the Sunshine Tour able to qualify via one of the top five slots in the International Federation ranking list. An exemption has also been established for the Africa Amateur Champion, with South African Alton van der Merle attending this year after winning the inaugural event last month. And that article was written by Martin McMillan. From the Herald Scotland, Wednesday the 6th of March, from the sports section, Rangers women's manager Joe Potter agrees new contract Report by sports writer David Irvin. Joe Potter has agreed a new contract at Rangers. The Rangers women's manager will remain at the club until at least the summer of 2026. Potter, a former England international, has led Rangers to an unbeaten SWPL campaign to date with 19 wins and 3 draws this term. Rangers currently sit top of the table. Rangers women have also reached the final of the Sky Sports Cup under Potter with a victory over Celtic in the semi-final. Potter's new deal comes as a boost ahead of Rangers women's Scottish Cup quarter-final match against Hibs on Sunday. Potter said of her new deal, I am really happy here. It was kind of a no-brainer for me when the club approached me about extending my stay. It is the start of something really special and the club has made me feel more than welcome and been really aligned with my views and my way of working. I have really enjoyed this last few months of being here. Women and Girls Managing Director Donald Gillies added 
Since I joined the club, I have thoroughly enjoyed my working relationship with Joe. I'm pleased that we were able to make swift progress in the contract discussions, which demonstrated how committed to Rangers she is. The professionalism, high standards and dedication that Joe and all of the coaching and support staff have given to make this club successful is evident both on and off the pitch. We hope that hard work is rewarded with some silverware and we are in a strong position to achieve that goal under Joe. Craig Robertson, Director of Football Operations, said All at the football club are delighted we can extend Joe's contract until 2026. Working alongside Donald and the rest of the staff, we believe Joe can continue the positive start to her managerial career, continually raising standards and expectations across the club. Joe and the rest of her team are relentless in their desire to bring success to the club and we are delighted that she has signed this new contract. And that story was written by David Irvin and read by me, Ian. This is from the Herald Scotland on Wednesday the 6th of March 2024 from the Voices section. How progress in eye care can have a wide range of benefits. This article is written by Robert Ray. Ophthalmic innovation continues to provide greater insights into eye conditions, but it is also unlocking an ever-expanding array of wider discoveries. Fundamentally, technology is transforming ophthalmology and NHS Scotland's workforce can take a lead on grasping its possibilities by identifying new avenues of innovation for high-quality, inclusive eye care. However, an NHS eye examination in Scotland is already more than just a test that can detect signs of sight-threatening conditions. It can also detect issues elsewhere in the human body, including diabetes, high blood pressure and cardiovascular disease. Researchers at the University of Edinburgh now believe that 3D eye scans could help track the often symptom-free early onset of kidney disease. The research team utilised highly magnified images to identify retinal changes, resulting in the conclusion that doing so facilitates a fast, non-invasive method of monitoring kidney health, which supports early diagnosis. Current screening tests are unable to detect the condition until half of the kidney function has been lost. But optical coherence tomography, OCT scanners, quickly create a cross-sectional picture of the retina. With this technology to hand, the university team found that patients with thinner retinas were suffering chronic kidney disease and this thinning progressed as kidney function declined. Conversely, the researchers noted that those who received a kidney transplant experienced a rapid thickening of the retina after surgery. Dr Neeraj Dawn, Professor of Nephrology at the University, concluded that the eye is a useful window into the kidney and the hope is now that the research will help identify more people with early kidney disease. Going forward, Such discoveries hold huge promise for further fostering collaborative partnerships that translate research, development and innovation, R, D and I, into every ophthalmic practice. The future possibilities are incredible, from artificial intelligence, AI, helping to predict a range of conditions such as age-related macular degeneration, AMD, and diabetic retinopathy, to further progress in telehealth that is already allowing patients to remotely send images of the eye to their doctor to triage. It all goes hand in hand with development of smarter working practices, an example being the ability to analyse daily intraocular pressure, IOP, fluctuations for the detection of glaucoma through the use of smart contact lenses which can transmit data from the eye to a mobile phone. That may be some way off for the NHS, but the technology is already there. Former NHS partner Inno Scott Health is seeking forward-thinking ophthalmic solutions that can help support the health service to strengthen 
and make meaningful change in this priority area of its recovery plan. We believe that the health services expert ophthalmologists and those in support roles are best placed to identify solutions in a rapidly evolving area. Encouraging NHS Scotland's diverse workforce to come up with new ideas that achieve better outcomes in pressured ophthalmology is vital and at the heart of InnoScot Health's latest innovation call, which offers a package of support to health and social care staff. Forward-thinking staff can be instrumental in making a vital contribution to an eye-opening future. That article was written by Robert Ray. This is from the Herald Scotland on Wednesday the 6th of March 2024 from the Business section. Shipbuilder Babcock to create 1,000 jobs at Rosyth. This article is written by Ian McConnell. Defence engineer and company Babcock International Group has revealed plans to create more than 1,000 new jobs at its large-scale advanced manufacturing and shipbuilding facility in Rosyth. It said the job creation will support the delivery of world-class programmes and development of its workforce capabilities. The roles will support programmes such as Type 31 Frigate Design and Build programme. The new job opportunities will include 400 apprenticeships, 350 production support operatives, skilled engineers, tradespeople and graduates. The company said, underpinning Babcock's commitment to further develop the skills required to support customers now and in the future, over the next four years, the new job opportunities will benefit both the UK economy and local communities. It added, the Production Support Operative Initiative is focused on attracting people from a range of backgrounds and experience, including those not currently in education, employment or training, with the roles centred around supporting and learning from time-served tradespeople. Babcock's latest recruits will join a state-of-the-art advanced manufacturing and digitally enabled facility that in recent decades has seen investment of more than £200 million. The company noted that apprentice numbers are also increasing at its operation on the west coast of Scotland, supporting His Majesty's naval base Clyde and the UK's submarine enterprise. It added that apprenticeship opportunities are expected to double in 2024. David Lockwood, Chief Executive of Babcock, said, Attracting and retaining talent is essential to the future success of our business and directly benefits the local communities in which we operate. Continued investment in Babcock's development programmes and facilities enables our apprentices graduates and trainees to experience a mix of on-the-job learning in a modern, digitally-led industrial environment alongside academic training, with further education partners and our own Babcock Skills Academy. He added, This week is Scottish Apprenticeship Week. Our apprentices play a really important role in our workforces across the UK ensuring we can sustain the technical skills needed to continue to deliver critical national defence programmes. That article was written by Ian McConnell. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 7th of March 2024 from the news section. Budget key points. Child benefit to money for Scotland. This article is written by Kathleen Nutt. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt unveiled a raft of measures in his spring budget, which he hoped would appeal to voters ahead of a general election this year. Mr Hunt was on his feet for one hour five minutes in the Commons, setting out his tax and spending plans, which he said was a plan for long-term growth. Among the key policies he outlined are an additional cut to national insurance, well-trailed announcement to the media ahead of his speech, 
The move will mean that from April 6th, employee national insurance will be cut by 2p, in addition to the 2p cut made in the autumn statement, from 10% to 8%, and self-employed national insurance will be cut from 8% to 6%. Mr Hunt said, it means an additional £450 a year for the average employee, or £350 for someone self-employed. When combined with the autumn reductions, it means 27 million employees will get an average tax cut of £900 a year, and 2 million self-employed a tax cut averaging £650. More than 2.4 million working people in Scotland will benefit from the change, the government said. Child Benefit Changes From April this year, the threshold to receive child benefit will rise from £50,000 a year to £60,000, with benefit to be reassessed on a household basis by April 2026. Currently, some child benefit is withdrawn when one parent earns more than £50,000 a year. But Mr Hunt said this needed to be changed to take account of household income. He said that means two parents earning £49,000 a year receive the benefit in full, but a household earning a lot less than that does not if just one parent earns over £50,000. Today, I set out plans to end that unfairness. Doing so requires significant reform to the tax system, including allowing HMRC to collect household-level information. We will therefore consult on moving the high-income child benefit charge to a household-based system to be introduced by April 2026. The measure will make almost half a million families better off by an average of nearly £1,300, the Chancellor said. Almost £300 million more for Scotland. Scottish Government will receive around £295 million additional funding through the Barnet formula, on top of the additional £1.4 billion it has received through its operation since its record £41 billion per year settlement at Spending Review 2021. The UK Government said that the sum was the largest in the history of devolution. Extending windfall tax on the profits of energy giants until 2029. The tax, which charges oil and gas companies an extra 35% on the money they make in the UK, will continue because higher oil and gas prices look likely to continue because of the ongoing war in Ukraine. The tax will, however, be abolished, should energy prices fall back down to more normal levels. The extension is expected to raise around £1.5 billion, Mr Hunt said. We want to encourage investment in the North Sea, so we will retain generous investment allowances for the sector, Mr Hunt said. We will also legislate in the Finance Bill to abolish the energy profits levy, should market prices fall to their historic norm for a sustained period of time. But because the increase in energy prices caused by the Ukraine war is expected to last longer, so too will the sector's windfall profits. So... I will extend the sunset on the energy profits levy for an additional year to 2029, raising £1.5 billion. The move will anger the Scottish Conservatives, who had called for the levy to end. Alcohol and fuel duty freeze. Pubs, breweries and distilleries are expected to benefit from a further freeze to alcohol duty until February 2025 saving consumers money on their favourite drink. The UK government said the average car driver will save £50 this year as the 5p cut and the freeze to fuel duty is maintained until March 2025. Non-dom regime Tax breaks for non-domiciled residents 
Those who are resident here, but not domiciled here for tax purposes, have been abolished. The measure will raise £2.7 billion pounds a year by 2028. Under present rules, foreign nationals who are domiciled abroad, but live in Britain, do not have to pay tax on their foreign income for up to 15 years. Change to VAT for small and medium-sized businesses. These enterprises will be supported to invest and grow through a £200 million extension of the Growth Guarantee Scheme, helping 11,000 small businesses across the UK access finance and an increase in the VAT registration threshold from £85,000 to £90,000, which will take around 28,000 small businesses UK-wide out of paying VAT altogether. State of the Economy The Office for Budget Responsibility, OBR, has forecast that the economy will expand by 0.8% this year, 1.9% next year and 2% in 2026. That is higher than the forecasts of 0.7%, 1.4% and 2% growth, respectively, in November. The OBR also forecasts that inflation will fall below 2% this year, from a level of 4% at present. That article was written by Kathleen Nutt. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 7th of March 2024 from the news section. Emma Caldwell murderer appeals conviction and sentence. This article is written by Jodie Harrison. A serial rapist who was sentenced to life for the murder of Emma Caldwell is planning to appeal against his conviction and sentence, court officials have said. Ian Packer, 51, was jailed for life with minimum terms of 36 years after being convicted of murdering sex worker Miss Caldwell in 2005. He was also found guilty of 11 charges of rape against nine women and convicted of 21 other charges following a trial at the High Court in Glasgow and is believed to be Scotland's worst sex offender. On Monday, he lodged notice of a bid to appeal against his conviction and sentence, the Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service said. Miss Caldwell vanished on April 4th, 2005, days after telling her mother, Margaret, that she planned to go to rehab to get off heroin. Her naked body was found in Limefield Woods near Roberton, South Lanarkshire, on May 8th, 2005 with a garrote around her neck, although a pathologist believes she may have been manually strangled. Packer had been reported to police for rape in 1999, but nothing was done, and he was first reported to have raped an underage girl in 1990. Judge Lord Beckett said Packer acted on pathological, selfish and criminal sexual desires, causing extreme and enduring suffering for so many women and their families. Miss Caldwell was described by her brother Jamie as wanting to help the vulnerable, while Packer looked for vulnerability and exploited it, the sentencing judge said. Mrs Caldwell has campaigned to get justice for her youngest daughter, who turned to heroin after losing her older sister Karen to cancer in 1998 for nearly 20 years. She has called for a public inquiry into the investigation of Packer, which left him free to attack other women, and met with First Minister Humza Yousaf at Butte House on Tuesday, before a meeting with Police Scotland Chief Constable Joe Farrell on Wednesday. A spokesperson for Scottish Courts and Tribunals Service said, Court can confirm an IIA, intimidation of intention to appeal, against conviction and sentence has been lodged on the 4th of the 3rd, 24, on behalf of Ian Packer. That article was written by Jodie Harrison. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 7th of March, 
2024 from the news section. River Kelvin Wildlife Sends My Spirits Soaring, says Libby Penman. This article is written by Susan Swarbrick. Libby Penman, wildlife filmmaker and photographer. Where is it? The River Kelvin in Glasgow. The stretch near the Blue Bridge at Glasgow Botanic Gardens is where I go all the time. Why do you go there? It is only a ten-minute walk from my flat, so that is where I went to practice while doing my master's degree in wildlife filmmaking. It became part of the daily walks during lockdown. It is a place where I honed a lot of my skills. I now know it like the back of my hand. How often do you go? Twice a day. I usually run there and try to get my camera out as well. How did you discover it? I have lived in the area for seven years. I like to joke that I'm on a first name basis with the Kingfisher because I see it all the time. I even did a film for BBC Two Spring Watch about the Kingfisher. I have filmed the otters in the Kelvin too. That was also shown on Spring Watch. Everyone had told me that you could see otters in Glasgow. I must have heard that a million times over the years and never saw them. It seemed like an urban myth. Then, one day, as it happens with wildlife, it was a normal, mundane scene on the river when suddenly three otters began playing with each other in the water. That was magical. What's your favourite memory? The first time I filmed a kingfisher diving, catching a minnow fish, coming back out, stunning the fish by beating it off the side of a branch and then eating it. Managing to record the entire sequence was amazing. I love the kingfisher, but cormorants are probably my favourite thing to photograph because they're so dramatic looking. I have a real soft spot for them. Who do you take? Absolutely everyone. Anyone who has ever visited me in Glasgow, friends and family, have been made to go for a walk by the River Kelvin. What do you take? If I go on a run, I won't have a phone, only my headphones and a watch. Typically, I will then see everything. Kingfishers, otters, cormorants, foxes, and have no way of recording it. When I go purposely to film, I take a camera bag with a 600mm long lens and a macro lens, the latter because I sometimes photograph mushrooms and different things along the river, a couple of cereal bars, a flask of coffee when it's cold. What do you leave behind? It's a double-edged sword when you get into wildlife filming and photography professionally. People often say they go out into nature to unwind and de-stress, but when it's part of your job, you can't be totally relaxed. Sum it up in five words. My wildlife, camera, training, ground. What other travel spot is on your wish list? I love mountains, so Nepal would be awesome. That article was written by Susan Swarbrick. This is from the Herald Scotland on Thursday the 7th of March 2024 from the news section. Scotch whisky industry welcomes alcohol duty freeze. This article is written by Christy Dorsey. The head of the Scotch Whisky Association has welcomed the extension of the alcohol duty freeze in today's budget, but added there continue to be great inequalities in alcohol taxation in the UK. Mark Kent said with cost pressures hurting bars and pubs throughout the UK, the decision by Chancellor Jeremy Hunt to keep duty rates at their present levels until February 2025 will provide some much-needed certainty and stability for the year ahead. He added that the move will incentivise investment and, as with previous cuts and freezes, boost Treasury revenue. Despite this freeze, Scotch whisky is still put at a disadvantage by the duty system, based on a fundamental misunderstanding of how people consume alcohol and modern drinking trends, Mr Kent said. 
With today's freeze, cider is still taxed four times less than a spirit, like Scotch whisky, and responsible consumers who enjoy a Scotch are paying too much tax compared with a beer or cider. Looking ahead, we will continue to work with the UK Government to ensure that our tax system is supporting the long-term success and prosperity of our iconic homegrown sectors, such as Scotch whisky, so that Scotch and other high-quality spirits are not put at a competitive disadvantage in the UK and other markets around the world. Traditionally, alcohol duty rates rise annually in line with inflation, but chancellors have during the past decade opted to freeze it. Presenting his spring budget, Mr Hunt told the Commons, In the autumn statement, I froze alcohol duty until August of this year. Without any action today, it would have been due to rise by 3%. He said he had listened to representations from MPs about the tax, adding, So today I have decided to extend the alcohol duty freeze until February 2025. The Chancellor has frozen duty across all four alcohol categories, meaning that the duty rate on spirits remains at the current level of £31.64 per litre of pure alcohol. This means that of the average price of £15.63 for a bottle of scotch, £11.40 is collected in taxation through duty and VAT, a tax burden of 73%. The duty freeze has more broadly been welcomed as a victory for bars and pubs, many of which are still struggling to recover from business loss during the COVID pandemic. Figures published in January by CGA Nielsen IQ showed that the number of licensed premises in Britain fell by 3.6% from 103,682 to 99,916 in the year to September, marking the first time that the total has dropped below 100,000. That article was written by Christy Dorsey. From the Herald, Scotland, Thursday the 7th of March, Sport, Neil Lennon declares Aberdeen interest as he admits Ireland near miss. Report by David Irvin. Neil Lennon has declared he would be interested in becoming Aberdeen manager. The former Celtic and Hibs manager was touted as a possible Petaudry contender before Neil Warnock was appointed until the end of the season. And Lennon, 52, has confirmed he would be keen on returning to the dugout and taking over at Aberdeen. Veteran boss Warnock is currently in charge on an interim basis while a major club review is undertaken. And Lennon has thrown his name into the mix as the next possible Aberdeen manager as he hailed the great potential at He said, I was linked with the Aberdeen job when it came up but at the time I was still involved with the Republic of Ireland process and I couldn't really take that on. Timing is important and the Aberdeen job is something I would be very much interested in, no question. I think there is great potential at Aberdeen. I didn't think I was as popular up there. It's nice to know that the fans like me. That's great. Lennon did come close to a return with ma- to management with Ireland, but missed out as the Football Association preferred a candidate with international experience. The ex-Celtic captain was a serious contender for the post, but won't become the manager of the national team. And Lennon further revealed, He's not back jobs for having been offered positions in the summer, but feeling the timing was off. He added, I was close to the Ireland job. I was disappointed to miss out on that. The feedback was positive. They wanted to go with someone with international experience. They have made a decision and that will be announced next month. I'm just looking to back in. I've a- I have had a bit of time out. I got offered a couple of jobs in the summer. The timing wasn't right and they didn't appeal to me. Neil Lennon was promoting Viaplay's live and exclusive coverage of Celtic v Livingston and Tabernian v Rangers on Sunday. Viaplay is available to stream from viaplay.com that's v-i-a-p-l-a-y dot c-o-m 
or via your TV provider on Sky, Virgin TV and Amazon Prime as an add-on subscription. And that report was by David Irvin. This letter is from a selection in the Herald on Thursday the 7th of March 2024. It is in the Voices section and the headline is The Problem with Trident. Could I gently insist to Jill Stevenson that our UK could not maintain the Trident system in an independent Scotland? Scotland would be required to surrender sovereignty over parts of its territory. That would require an involvement in Scotland by our UK security forces. Military personnel resident in those bases would be outside Scotland's legal system and there would be requirement for a huge agreed provision for recompense over a nuclear accident. The UK has made it clear that Britain could, in extremis, use Trident in a preemptive strike, even when the UK was not under attack. Trident could even be used when NATO was not involved. Scotland could not be a party to this scenario without a level of involvement, oversight and a veto which our UK simply could not agree to. I think a reasonable time, 10 years, could be set to allow for new bases to be constructed, perhaps in Cumbria. As someone who was involved with Standing Naval Force Atlantic, S-T-A-N-A-V-F-O-R-L-A-N-T, I am certain NATO would welcome our involvement. The geography of the North Atlantic Gap makes that obvious. Scotland pays almost five billion for UK defence, yet there is not a single large warship based anywhere in Scotland. G. R. Weir, Ockeltree. We could assess our own needs. Jill Stevenson claims to have insight into the mind of NATO General Secretary Jens Stoltenberg. Like many people who pay lip service to the concept of nuclear defence, she appears to understand very little about it. Years ago, Paddy Ashtine, who had actually served in the Royal Marines, raised the question of the diminished amphibious capacity of the Royal Navy and said that plans appeared to involve only two vessels, fearless and intrepid, one hauled out of mothballs, and commandeering a sea link ferry, a ludicrous position for a once proud seafaring nation. I cannot imagine the situation is any better today, particularly with the costly farce of the two most recent Trident tests, the last after a highly expensive refit. Trident's replacement, Dreadnought, is years behind schedule. This useless weapon, which would never be used without the consent of the US and may or may not still use a US-controlled Navstar satellite to target it, has in fact been the reason we no longer have a decent surface fleet, as any naval officer will tell you. In an independent Scotland, we could assess our genuine defence needs and act accordingly, rather than maintaining the illusion of great power status. Marjorie Ellis Thompson, Edinburgh These letters are from a selection in The Herald on Thursday the 7th of March 2024, they are found in the Voices section. and The headline, There's no way Scotland would ever be allowed to leave NATO. If there is one theme from your regular unionist correspondence that really gets my goat, it is the question of an independent Scotland's membership of NATO. Today it is the turn of Jill Stevenson, Letters, March 6, in the context of Scotland's harbouring of nuclear submarines, to express the utterly stupid idea that an independent Scotland would be either expelled or refused entry to NATO. Can we get this clear once and for all? If an independent Scotland expressed any idea of leaving NATO, it would be leaned on so heavily by the other NATO states that we would have to retire to a darkened room for a few weeks to recover. To put it simply, Scotland is Europe's and NATO's backdoor. Not only that, it is a backdoor so big that you could sail a navy of nuclear submarines, aircraft carriers and landing craft through it. The question of nuclear submarines being on the Clyde is an entirely different matter. And, for what it's worth, 
I disagree with the idea that we should necessarily want to remove them. Nuclear weapons are here to stay, and it's not as if we have needed them in the past to kill people in their millions. After independence, Scotland will have to take its share of the NATO burden. If adjacent nations feel that owning a nuclear deterrent makes them feel good, then there is an opportunity for Scotland to lease Fastlane on advantageous terms to that nation. If nuclear weapons are unleashed, then it doesn't matter where we are, we're all getting it, and that includes large parts of our nearest neighbour where nuclear weapons are stored and from where they can be deployed. John Jameson, Air. From the Herald of Scotland, Thursday the 7th of March, from the Arts and Entertainment section, Big Noise Project helped Govan Hill Teen follow classical music dream. Report by Jodie Harrison. A talented teenager with his sights set on a career in classical music has told how a groundbreaking community music and social change program transformed his life. Eden MacDonald, 17, has been part of the Big Noise program in Govan Hill, Glasgow, since he was seven and is now preparing to study music at the prestigious Royal Conservatoire of Scotland. Big Noise is delivered by Charity Sistema Scotland. It uses the power of music and nurturing relationships to help children in Scotland's most disadvantaged areas build their confidence, resilience, attainment and ambition. Vicky Williams, Chief Executive of Sistema Scotland said, We are so proud of Aidan and all he has achieved. We are always thrilled to see our participants grow up with us and go on to do the things they dream of when they leave school. While some participants like Aidan choose to pursue their musical talents, many others have found bright futures in a range of different areas in work, study or training. The important thing is that, that Big Noise teaches young people the vital life skills they will need as they move on to adulthood and we know that whatever the children in our programmes go on to do, they will carry confidence resilience and sense of support and care with, with them for the rest of their lives. Aidan lives in Govan Hill with his mum, Julie, who works as a carer. He is currently studying at the music school at Douglas Academy in Mulgai. The unit is for young musicians of exceptional ability to continue their general education while receiving specialist instrumental tuition and extra time for musical studies. Aidan learned to play the viola and performed in the Scottish Parliament through Big Noise. He was recently awarded a scholarship to the Royal Conservatoire of Scotland Seniors Programme. He has performed on BBC Scotland and gained a place in the National Youth Orchestra of Great Britain, performing at the Barbican in London. He was given a leadership role in a full bursary, something he describes as a massive achievement. He became co-principal viola of the National Youth Orchestra of Scotland, is Principal Viola at the RCS Juniors and led an orchestra for the Benedetti Sessions as well as winning the RSC Juniors Concerto Competition. Aidan said, I have achieved more than I could ever have imagined. Big Noise opened a whole new world and it changed my life. I started with Big Noise when I was seven. I was in P2 and he came to my school and showed us the, the instruments. I had never seen anything like it. I got to pick one to play and from there on I went to Big Noise and played music. Big Noise changed my whole life. They made me more confident. I was encouraged to perform and try new things. He added, having something outside of school was great. It was a different world. It was like a second family for me. Aidan's mum, Julie, said, Big Noise has opened so many opportunities for Aidan over the years. I'm so proud of everything he has achieved musically. The staff have been amazing and I can't thank them enough for their support and guidance they have provided to Aidan and myself on his musical journey throughout the years. For the last 10 years, players of People's Postcode Lottery have been supporting the charity and, to date, have raised £4 million to help programmes in six targeted communities. Rathlock and Fallon, in Stirling, Govan Hill, in Glasgow, Torrey, in Aberdeen, Douglas in Dundee and Wester Hales in Edinburgh. Laura Chow, Head of Charities at People's Postcode Lottery said, Aiton's story shows the real power of music and we're delighted that our players are supporting such wonderful projects, bringing communities together 
in helping children and young people gain confidence and skills they can take with them through their lives. And, of course, we wish Aidan well with his studies. And that report was by Jodie Harrison. This is from the Herald Scotland on Friday the 8th of March 2024. From the news section. Sack the board. Island protest group demand radical Calmac change. Exclusive by Martin Williams, senior news reporter. The Transport Minister has been told by island business leaders that the top tier of management with ferry operator Calmac should be sacked, including Chief Executive Robbie Drummond, before it gets an uncontested contract to continue lifeline services, the Herald can reveal. The South Uist Business Impact Group, which began a major public protest after years of frustration at the islands being impacted by major ferry cancellations, has told Fiona Hislop that it supports the direct award of the Lifeline Clyde and Hebrides ferry service, but only if there are major changes at the top of Scottish Government-owned Calmac. It has backed a campaign by the National Union of Rail, Maritime and Transport Workers to keep the ferry service in public hands, and that the ferry operator should be given a direct award of the contract. A rethink over the way Calmac shuffles its ferry deck when there are breakdowns in the ageing fleet, have come when a protest organised by the group saw an estimated 500 residents, 200 cars, 40 vans and 20 lorries converge on Loch Boysdale, the port which links South Uist to the mainland, in June last year, to protest about how they have faced the brunt of lifeline service cancellations. The Scottish Government's bid to provide a direct public contract to Calmac to run the ageing ferry fleet without going through a competitive tendering process has already been opposed by its community board. It is understood that a permanent contract is an option on the table after it emerged that an uncontested direct award to state-owned Calmac is the preferred option for the next contract over the future of lifeline ferry services. It comes after the ferry operator received some £10.5 million in poor performance fines in the six and a half years since Calmac took the franchise, nearly eight times more than in its first nine years in charge of the West Coast fleet. Calmac's current £975 million eight-year Clyde and Hebrides ferry services contract expires in September 2024. It had previously won the contract for six years in 2007, after ministers were forced to tender for routes to satisfy European competition rules. The Scottish Government has said that a direct award with no contest from other potential bidders is the preferred option, closing the door on opening routes up to private operators. The South Uist group of businesses said that they want a service that is more fit for purpose and that a Complete root and branch revamp is required. John Daniel Pitarana of the group, which met Miss Hislop two weeks ago, said that the group's support for direct award came with huge provisos, one being that the management of Calmac should be replaced, including Mr Drummond. He said, At this stage, with the contract expiring in September, there would be chaos caused if there was no direct award to keep the service running. It would be bonkers to do otherwise. We suggested to the Minister that the only way we could see the whole thing working is with new management at the top of Calmac that are more customer focused. From what we see, it is just a dictatorship at the top. What Robbie says is what happens, and everybody falls in line. The group say a complete root and branch revamp is required, with islanders served by Calmac and the ferry operator staff driving the standards that should be provided. They say the current arrangement is failing to do so, and as a result, island businesses are struggling and the impact on the community is becoming irreversible. Mr Peterana added, Top tier of management should be replaced, and the islanders who are served should have a direct input as to what and how the services are run, not on a day-to-day basis, but on a strategic level, including setting the goals of the company. That is what we have fed to the minister. He said Ms Hislop wasn't surprised that they had called for the heads of Calmac management, but neither agreed or disagreed. 
She assured us that we would have far more input and control by islanders going forward, said Mr Peter Anna. There is a paper being created by Transport Scotland's Ferries Division looking at the legalities of direct award, which is being presented to the Minister in August. She explained that in her head, rather than the current situation, there would be more control over what Calmac could and couldn't do. Calmac would be made to be more customer-focused. They welcomed an assurance from the Minister that six new ferries, including the wildly over-budget and delayed Ferguson marine vessels and four being built in Turkey, would be added to the network by 2026. But they said that did not give reassurance to the community of the reliability of the service for the next few years. Businesses will have to fold by the time we see these new vessels, if not enough is done to help protect the businesses and the vital transport links on and off the island, he said. The RMT is to hold a series of public meetings across areas covered by the ferry network from March the 14th, as it seeks a people's Calmac. They fear privatisation would destroy the stability, quality, safety and employment standards integral to lifeline public transport services. A Scottish Government spokesman said, The Cabinet Secretary for Transport welcomed the recent engagement with the South Uist Business Impact Group as part of a series of wider engagements in the Western Isles last week and the opportunity to hear directly from them on the impacts of ferry disruptions. Scottish ministers are currently consulting on the next Clyde and Hebrides ferry services contract and would encourage all stakeholders to respond to the formal consultation and to attend the public events that are taking place. Decisions around senior staffing are for the board of Calmac to consider. Calmac was approached for comment. That article was by Martin Williams. The Herald on the 8th of March and the Arts and Ends section explained what is the star of Caledonia by Jody Harrison. Plans to build a giant sculpture which will tower over the Scottish border have taken a step forward, but what is it? The Star of Caledonia has been on the agenda for more than a decade, but looks as though it could finally go ahead after planning permission was formally applied for. The massive sculpture would rival the Angel of the North, its designers say, and draw in thousands of tourists each year. But what is actually planned? The idea for the Titanic movement was first sparked 20 years ago when local farmer and tourism business owner Alastair Houston suggested this scheme in response to the damage caused to the region by foot and mouth epidemic among cattle. Landscape sculptor Charles Jenks was recruited as a creative director and a search was launched to find a fitting design. After around a decade of to and froing involving the local community, Scottish academics, cultural thinkers, seminars and workshops, Dumfries and Galloway Council, Creative Scotland, Scottish Enterprise, Dumfries and Galloway and the Nuclear Decommissioning Fund, sculptor Cecil Bellman's design was picked. Plans have crept forward since then, which wrangles over the site and the COVID pandemic causing noticeable slowdowns. Originally planned for 2014, then 2021, it looks as though things are finally about to take shape. Essentially curves running along an invisible sphere interspersed with rods, the Star of Caledonia takes its inspiration from many fields, most notably science and the work of local giant of the field, James Clark Maxwell, who discovered electromagnetism. According to the developers, the artwork will act as a metaphor for the dynamism of the Scottish nation, symbolising the energy and power of Scottish invention, and will be a welcome to Scotland. In Cecil Bellman's own words, the concept for the star began with the border drawn as a dashed line. In between the gaps, the journeys are marked as a series of waves flowing in and out. They are different in amplitudes and frequencies. The scenario of multiple waves offers a field of energy. Patterns emerge when you zoom in on the waves, including the image of the salt tire. As my metaphor for energy evolved, I focused on the curves folding over each other as representation for Scottish brain power. Big ideas lead to big sculptures. The star would tower over the main road into Scotland and rival the Angel of the North in time and weir in terms of stature. 
At 35 metres tall, it would be one of the biggest works of public art in the UK. It is also hoped that it would attract big crowds, with a thousand tourists with coming to see it, bringing much needed revenue into the area. With the site identified, all that's needed is permission to go ahead and build the star. Susan Houston, chair of the Star of Caledonia Trust, the team behind the project, said, We have always believed this project would happen. And with a new site and new plans, we have a new start. This revival is transformational and marks a pivotal moment for Gretna Green and the surrounding area, symbolising resilience and adaptability in the face of challenges. As the Star of Caledonia gets a new home, the project is not just about a landmark sculpture, but a catalyst for tourism, local economies and community pride. And that was by Jody Harrison. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 11th of March, from the news section, Ash Regan claims Scottish Greens blocked prostitution reform. Report by Jodie Harrison. Prostitution reforms were hampered by the Scottish Government's power sharing agreement with the Greens, Ash Regan has claimed. The former SNP MSP defected to Alba in October 2023, a year after quitting as Community Safety Minister over her opposition to gender reforms. During her tenure, she announced plans to change the law in the sex trade with the 2021 programme for government pledging to challenge the male demand for prostitution. However, the Scottish Greens, who joined the government as part of the Butte House Agreement in 2021, equally pledged to fight for the decriminalisation of sex work, arguing doing so would ensure workers were protected from exploitation, trafficking and violence. In an interview with Holyrood magazine, Ms Regan said she saw her proposals on restricting the sales of firework progress to law, while the prostitution changes remain the same, despite being introduced at the same time. Ms Regan told the magazine she found resistance to reforming the purchase of sex laws, despite the Scottish Government's stance that it was a form of violence against women. She said, I began to think that especially after 2021, which was when the Butte House Agreement was signed, I managed to get the prostitution reform onto the slate. I had it at one point as early as year three, but then it kept slipping and I would look again and it would be on year four or f- year five. I began to think this was not going to be able to progress because this was not something that the Green Party would sign up to. Ms Regan is now set to bring the plans back to Holyrood as part of a member's bill. Her unviable campaign aims to criminalise those who purchase sex in Scotland. It comes, as she told the magazine, not seeing the proposals become law was a source of professional regret. If you look in detail at what the SNP Green Coalition government has pursued, it's the areas where there is more policy alignment, she said. The fireworks bill became law, and the prostitution law didn't get to that point, which is a source of professional regret. The Scottish Government said its recent strategy will help to inform future legislative considerations including whether to criminalise the purchase of sex. The strategy will challenge the male demand for prostitution by helping women safely exit commercial exploitation. A pilot scheme has been announced to facilitate this and allows sex workers to link up with more mainstream services such as housing, health and social security. Work will start in the summer, with the scheme to be first rolled out in the Edinburgh and Borders areas before being expanded into the Highlands, Perth and Kinross, Aberdeen and Dundee, and then Glasgow and Ayrshire. A spokesperson said, Lessons learned from the strategy will help inform any future legislative considerations, including whether to criminalise the purchase of sex. And that report was by Jodie Harrison. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 11th of March, from the news section, Biggest Conservative Donor Accused of Racist Diana Abbott Comments by Gabrielle Mackay The biggest donor to the Conservative Party is reported to have said seeing former Labour MP Diana Abbott made him want to hate all black women and that she should be shot. Frank Hester, who has given £10 million to the party in the past year, made the controversial comments in a meeting at his healthcare technology firm The Phoenix Partnership according to The Guardian. 
Speaking about an unnamed executive from another company in a meeting, Mr. Hester is alleged to have said, She's shit. She's the shittest person. Honestly, I try not to be sexist, but when I meet somebody like the executive, it's like trying not to be racist, but you see Diane Abbott on the TV and you're just like, I hate. You just want to hate all black women because she's there. And I don't hate all black women at all, but I think she should be shot. The executive and Diane Abbott need to be shot. She's stupid. If we can get the executive being unprofessional, we can get her sacked. It's not as good as her dying. It would be much better if she died. She's consuming resource. She's eating food that other people could eat, you know? Ms Abbott is currently suspended by the Labour Party as it carries out an investigation into the Hackney and Stoke North Newington's MP's comments. Jewish, Irish and Traveller people were not subject to racism all their lives. The newspaper further reports that Mr Hester called all foreign employees to a 2019 meeting to defend himself against online reviews alleged to be from former staff accusing him of racist comments. In that meeting, he's alleged to have said, I make a lot of jokes about racism, about our different creeds and cultures, but I just want to assure you that it's just the most abhorrent thing. I want to clear the air and make sure we all know where we are, what we stand for, and we take the piss out of the fact that all our Chinese girls sit together in Asian corner, which they do. A TPP spokesperson said, as the safe and trusted custodians of 80 million medical records in the UK and around the world, we always hire the best people for the job, regardless of race, gender, sexuality or any other characteristic. We take care of our people and celebrate diversity in our workplace. We reward our staff well, encouraging them to work collaboratively, to take ownership of their responsibilities and to demonstrate the commitment and professionalism that the NHS patients and our customers around the world deserve. Having recently witnessed the tragic consequences that can be caused when software systems or major public services fail, we are proud to demand the highest standards of our staff to ensure we can continue to safely and reliably support our health service. And that article was written by Gabriel Mackay. From the Herald Scotland, Monday the 11th of March, from the news section, plans revealed for £250 million revival of Glasgow's Charing Cross by Scott Wright. Proposals for a once-in-a-lifetime transformation of Charing Cross in Glasgow, which would include the removal of the Tay House Bridge over the M8 motorway, have been submitted to the City Council. Developers are seeking planning permission in principle for a £250 million project that they say will reimagine the area to the west of the city centre. The project will be spread over two phases, the first of which includes the construction of student accommodation and a healthcare slash GP surgery facility. Phase two envisages a mixed tenure residential development, combining homes, office space and a hotel. The removal of the Tay House Bridge will have a transformational effect to the developers, providing the opportunity to create a new gateway into the city centre. Behind the proposals are CXG Glasgow Limited, a subsidiary of Tracy Investments Limited and owner of the Venlo Building and Elmbank Gardens, in conjunction with the owner of the property at 300 Bath Street. The master plan has been devised by Michael Laird Architects, the plans have been backed by Stuart Pat- Patrick, Chief Executive of Glasgow Chamber of Commerce. Mr Patrick said, The city's three main universities have confirmed a strategic aim to grow the student numbers in the years ahead, and accommodation has to expand in line with that, especially when you consider how limited the options are at the moment. A development like this caters for that need, while plugging into ongoing plans for to transform a key part of the city's traditional retail and hospitality artery. It's no secret that Socky Hall Street has seen better days and this application presents an opportunity to galvanise an iconic area of the city and re-establish it as a dynamic accommodation and business hub. And that report was by Scott Wright. From the Herald Scotland, Sunday the 10th of March, from the sports section, Celtic 4, Livingston 2. 
Instant reaction to the burning issues. Report by Graham McGarry. Celtic eventually saw off a dogged Livingston side to reach the semi-finals of the Scottish Cup, with a Dyson Maeda hat-trick helping them to Hamden after a difficult afternoon at Celtic Park. Maeda opened the scoring early on and the home fans settled back for a procession, but Livingston shocked the cup holders by hitting back almost immediately through a composed Daniel Mackay finish. The visitors shot themselves in the foot though, as dithering from Christian Montano eventually allowed Maeda to nod the host back in front, before Teddy Yingu sensationally jolly on level once more after the break with another well-taking goal. Maeda wasn't finished there though, tapping home Celtics on his own third to bring up his hat-trick, before Kyogo Furuhashi put some gloss in the scoreline by racing him behind to slam home in stoppage time. Here are the talking points from Celtic Park. Maeda shines to drag Celtic over the line. The winger can sometimes be hit and miss, but when he's on his game, as he was here, then he has a massive handle for any defence, and ultimately his movement proved too much for Livy to live with. He showed some impressive composure to slot home his first, not always a quality that is really associated with Maeda, who tends to be one of the players whose finishing is better the less time he has to think about it. He then showed good anticipation to follow on in Matt O'Reilly's shot that was palmed out by a Livy goalkeeper, Michael McGovern, forcing it over the line for his second, and he did brilliantly to ghost in on the blindside of Jamie Brandon to finish Tomiki Iwata's cutback and allow his team to finally shake off the Lions with just five minutes remaining. Celtic home stutters reappear after Dundee demolition. Yes, Celtic were missing key men. And yes, due credit must be given to Livingston, who produced one of their best displays of the season to give their host such a hard time of it. But the fact that it took cup holders so long to shake off the challenge of the Premiership's bottom side on their home patch must concern manager Brendan Rodgers and the Andes Celtic faithful. They started the game well enough and got the early goal they craved, but from there on in it was a hard watch for the punters who braved a chilly March afternoon to witness it. No wonder they were getting restless long before the end. In truth, there may have been far too many of these stuttering home displays papered throughout Celtic season and, as they laboured through a tough second half in particular, the crushing win over Dundee here a couple of weeks ago seemed but a distant memory. At least though, they got the job done and there was huge relief when Maeda and then Kyogo struck the late killer blows. Celtic defence shaky without Cameron Carter-Vickers. Carter-Vickers was a late withdrawal from the Celtic squad after feeling a little something in his hamstring in training on Saturday, according to Rodgers, and it is little wonder that the Celtic manager is being cautious with his main centre-back. Their back line looks shaky whenever the American international is absent, and the partnership between Liam Scales and Stephen Welsh that was fielded here was no different, with the physicality of Yenge in particular giving Scales a real issue. The goal that Livingston scored was hugely preventable from a Celtic point of view, with a simple tap over the top from Montano releasing Kelly into acres of space and behind. The wide, man, the wide man actually did well to retain his composure, given how long he had to size up his finish, and he was just a peach across Joe Hart and into the far corner. But it would have been all too easy from the perspective of Rodgers, and it wasn't the only time during the game that the visitors caused some panic around Celtic Park by simply getting the ball in behind for the runners to chase. It was a similar story as Liffey drew themselves level for a second time, with Brandon dispossessing O'Reilly and releasing Yenge in behind. O'Reilly managed to get back up to hold him up momentarily, but the big striker cut inside and released a brilliant effort beyond heart to stun Celtic once more. Every Celtic fan will be desperately hoping that Cam Carter Mickers' mission here was simply precautionary, with his qualities as a defender and as a leader, particularly in the absence of Captain Callum McGregor. Sorely missed. Nicholas Kuhn impresses early on, but fades. It is fair to say that the winger has failed to really catch the eye in these early days of his Celtic career, but he was handed an opportunity to impress here and he seemed intent on grasping it. He was operating from the right but didn't always free for the option of cutting inside to his stronger left foot, which kept his direct opponent Montano guessing. Twice in the early stages, he got down to the outside and in behind the Levy defence, but couldn't quite find the killer cross. When he did cut inside the next time, he received the ball though, and he did manage to unlock Levy and find Maeda arriving late at the back post with a brilliant pick out, 
and the Japanese did the race by finishing Cooley under McGovern. From then on, Kuhn rather drifted out of the action, and when he did get involved, his final ball was left wanting, and there was more of a spark on the Celtic right when James Forrest came on to replace the German with around 15 minutes to go. All in all, it was another mixed bag from Kuhn, but at least there were some fleeting glimpses of what he can bring to the party. Livingston have unearthed a diamond in Teti Yenge. Quite apart from his brilliantly taken goal, Livingston striker Yenge put on a hugely impressive display and was a constant menace to the Celtic defence. It would be far too easy though to focus solely on his physical attributes as much as they do allow him to give defenders like Skills and Welsh nightmares. The lad can play too, showing a deft touch and neat footwork when it was played up to him on the deck. He now has five goals for the Lions since his January arrival and, if Davy Martindale's men are to have any chance of pulling off the great escape at the bottom of the table, it is in Yenge where they can find that hope. And that report was by Graeme McGarry. From the Herald Scotland, Sunday the 10th of March, from the sports section, Hibs nil, Rangers 2. Clermont's men cruise into semi-final. This article is unattributed. Rangers booked their place in the Scottish Gas Scottish Cup semi-finals with a 2-0 win over 9-man Hibernian at Easter Road. Midfielder John Lundstrom bundled in the opener in the 23rd minute after Hibs keeper David Marshall had saved a penalty from captain James Tavernier. Hibs attacker Martin Boyle was taken to hospital with an injury following a duel with defender John Souter, and Philip Clermont's side wobbled at the start of the second half, looking weary after their battling 2-2 draw with Benfica in the Europa League in Lisbon on Thursday night. However, Hibernian defender Jordan Obita was sent off in the 68th minute for picking up the second of two yellow cards for a foul on Rabi Matondo, before Nathan Mariah Welsh was shown a straight red by referee Steve McLean, three minutes later for a foul on Lundstrom. Portuguese striker Fabio Silva added a second in the 83rd minute to take Rangers into the last four draw, along with Aberdeen and Celtic, with Championship side Morton hosting Hearts on Monday night. However, there were more injuries for Clermont to deal with, Dujon Sterling and his replacement Josh Ross McCausland going off during a pulsating game. Hibs defender Chris Cadden made his first start of the season after his long-term injury absence, with midfielder Nectar Triantis also coming in, as injured Lewis Miller and Dylan Venti dropped out. Despite their European exertions, the visitors were unchanged, with Cyril Dessas and Silva in attack, with the former knocking across from Lepat Ritha and Yumas past the near post after 30 minutes of frenetic beginning. Moments later, Jack Butland almost got caught dribbling along his six-yard box by attacker Meizani Maiolida, the ball coming off the post after a tackle and ricocheting off the keeper for a corner, which came to nothing. Then Dezers robbed hesitant Obita down the left flank and drove into the box, but his angle drive was blocked by Marshall for a corner, which was defended. Obita compounded his error in the 21st minute when he tripped Sterling inside the penalty area, leaving the referee McLean with little option but to point to the spot. Tavernier's driven penalty was parried out by Mark Marshall, but Lindstrom was quicker than the Hibs defenders to react and forced the ball over the line from a few yards out. Marshall then saved a powerful drive from Sterling minutes later before the light blues utility player pulled up with what looked like a hamstring problem and had to be replaced by McCausland. Hibs had their own injury concerns soon afterwards when Boyle and Souter collided in an aerial duel just outside the Rangers penalty area and the winger, after a lengthy stoppage, was taken from the field on a stretcher his place taken by Eli Johan. The visitors had to withstand sustained pressure when the game resumed and after Rangers defender Connor Goldson filled Emiliano Marcondes 30 yards out, the Hibs forward forced a fine diving save from Butland with his curling free kick. Then substitute McCausland limped off to be replaced by Matondo, with Kimar Roof on for Dessers, before the hosts were reduced to 10 men when Obita, already booked for a foul on Tom Warrens, saw a second yellow for a tackle on Matondo, with Moria Welsh following him minutes later after scything down Lundstrom. And it was the former Sheffield United midfielder who set up Silva to rifle British rifle in Rangers second from 14 yards to settle an eventful cup tie and secure a last four place at Hampden Park. It could have been more, 
substitute Cole McKinnon having the ball in the net and added time only to see the offside flag up. And that article was unattributed. This is from the Herald Scotland on Tuesday the 12th of March 2024. From the Voices section. Tories' inflation and interest rates claims do not stack up. This article is written by Ian McConnell. Maybe it is fuelled by an idea that if you say something often enough, people will accept it as fact. But the Tories' tiresome claim that they have reduced inflation continues to look laughable. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt was banging the drum about the Conservatives having brought down inflation in a budget speech last week that seemed eerily familiar in its messaging. There are a lot of television reruns in the early afternoon, and most of them probably look a lot less familiar to those who have seen them before than a budget from Mr Hunt. The inflation claim was, of course, part of the familiar routine. Mr Hunt said, Of course, interest rates remain high as we bring down inflation. But, because of the progress we've made, because we are delivering the Prime Minister's economic priorities, we can now help families, not just with temporary cost of living support, but with permanent cuts in taxation. We do this to give much needed help in challenging times. For the avoidance of doubt, the Bank of England set interest rates. It has a 2% target for annual UK Consumer Prices Index inflation set by the government, but this has been unchanged since a long time before the Conservatives came to power in 2010. So, the interest rates remain high as we bring down inflation talk was the most curious interpretation of the situation from the Chancellor. This is not where the curiousness stopped, however. Mr Hunt said of inflation on Wednesday, When the Prime Minister and I came into office, it was 11%, but the latest figures show it is now 4%, more than meeting our pledge to halve it last year. And today's forecasts from the OBR, Office for Budget Responsibility, show it falling below the 2% target in just a few months' time nearly a whole year earlier than forecast in the autumn statement. That did not happen by accident. Whatever the pressures and whatever the politics, this government, working with the Bank of England, will always put sound money first. So what about that did not happen by accident declaration? It happened, of course, in large part because of base year effects, after the Tories played a not insignificant part in propelling annual inflation to a 41-year high of 11.1% in October 2022. It is interesting that Mr Hunt chooses to take the month in which he and Mr Sunak were appointed to their current roles, October 2022, as the starting point. However, Mr Sunak was Chancellor from February 2020 to July 2022, a period during which inflation spiralled. And it would have been incredible, given base year effects, had inflation not more than halved from 11%. A scenario in which this did not happen does not bear thinking about. A continuing cost of living crisis is utterly grim as things stand. Bragging about the annual UK Consumer Prices Index inflation of 4%, double the Bank of England's target, truly beggars belief. Especially given the excruciating price rises that have already been baked in, and are weighing so heavily on households. The UK's inflation problem has been much greater than that of many other developed countries, and many experts have highlighted the part which Brexit has played in the UK's particular inflation woe. Brexit has played a big part in pushing food prices for hard-pressed households higher. It has also exacerbated greatly the UK's skills and labour shortages crisis, fueling wage inflation. The claim from Mr Hunt that this government will always put sound money first 
is, quite frankly, ridiculous. It is the Bank of England which has hiked UK base rates from a record low of 0.1% in December 2021 to 5.25%. There is, of course, room for debate over the bank's decisions on interest rates. It may be the old lady of Threadneedle Street moved too late in starting to raise rates. Some believe this may have led to rates rising further than was needed. And it's easy to see the rationale behind arguments that the bank has gone too far with its rate rises, with the UK economy having tumbled into recession in the final three months of last year. Former Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee member Danny Blanchflower, writing exclusively in the Herald last June, observed that Brexit and its devastating impact on supply chains, especially for food, sets the UK apart from every other country. Mr Blanchflower said last June there was a very considerable probability on the basis of the Bank of England's own forecasts out to 2026 that there would be deflation, and asked, how can you raise rates with a forecast that says you should be cutting rates? They are out of their minds. In contrast, the Tories do not set interest rates, but they seem happy enough with the Bank of England's decisions, even though the UK economy has fallen into recession. Mr Hunt said on Wednesday, We understand that tackling inflation whilst necessary is painful. It means higher interest rates and a period of lower growth. It has not looked painful for senior Tories in the government though, and many might feel they quite simply do not understand at all. That article was written by Ian McConnell. The Herald on the 12th of March and the news section. ScotRail pays out £1.5 million compensation since national nationalisation by Jody Harrison. More than £1.5 million has been paid out in compensation by ScotRail since the service was nationalised according to new figures. The rail service was brought into public ownership in 2022 after a slew of failings by former operator Abello. Figures released to the Scottish Tories under Freedom of Information legislation showed a total of £1,526,649.92 was paid out since April 1, 2022 as a result of delays, cancellations or disruptions. It's understood, however, that £1 million of the compensation claims were made due to issues out with the operator's control. Scottish Tory Transport spokesman Graham Simpson described the level of compensation as absolutely staggering and called for the Scottish Government to come up with a plan to improve the country's railway. Taxpayers are footing an enormous bill as a result of the SNP typically over-promising and under-delivering, he said. Nicola Sturgeon and other senior SNP figures promised a bright new future for our railways under nationalisation, but the exact opposite has occurred. Suffering passengers have had to endure endless delays, cancellations and disruption to services as a result of the overwhelming failures of, from successive SNP transport ministers. Within weeks, journeys had been axed and an emergency timetable had to be put in place. He added, given Fiona Hislop now has the sole focus on transport in the SNP cabinet, she must urgently outline a real vision for the rail network. She should be pulling out all the stops to encourage people into public transport and to reduce these compensation payments. Phil Campbell, Director of Customer Operations for ScotRail, said the operator was absolutely committed to delivering the best service adding the number of compensation cases paid since April 1 is equal to just 0.07% of almost 126 million customer journeys and the overwhelming majority of those claims related to incidents out with the control of Scott Rail. These include severe weather resulting in disruption or line closure and infrastructure issues or track improvements. It's always unfortunate to see any disruption across the rail network, and we know this is frustrating for ScotRail customers. And everyone at ScotRail is working hard to ensure reliability and performance of our services. 
A spokeswoman for Transport Scotland said, rather than make misinformed comments about past disruption, particularly when blamed for over £1 million pounds of the compensation lies elsewhere, we are focused on ensuring the publicly owned ScotRail is a success. And that was by Jody Harrison. The Herald on the 12th of March and the news section. Yousaf slated on independence as he condemns other parties on Brexit by Tom Gordon. Hamza Yousaf has been accused of failing to see the parallels between Brexit and independence ahead of a speech attacking Labour and the Tories over Europe. The First Minister will use a speech at the London School of Economics to claim that Scotland's public services would be £1.6 billion better off if the UK was still in the EU. Yet at Westminster there is agreement between Rishi Sunak and Keir Starmer that the UK should stay out of both the EU and the huge European single market, whatever the cost, Mr Yousaf will say today as he makes the case for independence. However, the Scottish Liberal Democrats said the upheaval of independence would be Brexit on steroids and that the SNP's economic credibility was down the drain. Mr Yousaf is in London for a two-day visit that includes events with Westminster reporters and the European media, as well as a podcast with LBC broadcaster James O'Brien. The main event is a live stream speech from the LSC this afternoon aimed at promoting Scotland's economic potential. Titled Building Prosperity Through Social Solidarity and Economic Dynamism, it will outline the continued negative impact of Brexit on the economy and Scotland's chance to break from the cosy Westminster no-change consensus through independence. The First Minister is expected to stay at the combined powers of independence and a return to EU membership would help drive up living standards and create a fairer, stronger Scottish economy. In Scotland, I believe there's a broad public agreement that Brexit has damaged the economy and public services and that it should be reversed, he will say. The National Institute for Economic and Social Research suggests that compared to EU membership, the UK economy was 2.5% smaller in 2023 and expects that figure to rise to 5.7% in little more than 10 years' time. That means £69 billion could have been wiped from national income in 2023, equating to £28 billion of tax revenue, £2.3 billion in terms of Scotland's population share. Around 60% of spending in Scotland is devoted uh, devolved services. With the same level of borrowing and taxation, that means without Brexit, devolved spending power for our vital public services such as the NHS, could have been £1.6 billion higher than it is today. In other words, Scotland has suffered an estimated £1.6 billion cut that could have been invested in our NHS because of a Brexit that people in Scotland overwhelmingly rejected. Giving people a choice over their future with the opportunity to escape the cosy Westminster no-change consensus has never been more urgent or essential. Lib Dem NSP Willie Rennie said Hamza Yousaf lost the argument over independence in 2014, and since then his arguments have only got worse. Everyone can see that Brexit has been bad for the economy. Why would everyone want the same thing on steroids with independence? No one was forcing his government to make such a mess of the Ferguson ferries. The SNP's economic credibility has poured down the drain. And that was by Tom Gordon. That concludes this week's edition of the Herald Scotland podcast. Please remember to subscribe to our channels at Tune Review and tell your friends about our service.